selling healthy skin is big business. There are hundreds of products marketed to us, often touting some health benefit or another. And if you have a loved one like I do with painful and irritating skin conditions, like my oldest has pretty severe eczema, you might find yourself going down a rabbit hole of confusing messages about what's optimal hygiene, what's best for skin health, all sorts of messages, all sorts of claims. We're constantly inundated with these confusing messages and questionable health claims about what products we should be incorporating into our hygiene routines. Often, this means trying to choose between expensive gels, ointments, lotions, shampoos, conditioners, all to try to support skin radiance, eliminate natural body odors, and it takes up a lot of time to try to figure out if what you're doing is actually helpful and healthy for yourself and your kids. So what do we actually mean when we say we want clean and healthy skin? I'm Dr. Neha Bhattak, and you're listening to Health Discovered, a podcast by WebMD. When we think about hygiene or skincare, what do we think about? I think it's not just water and soap that we probably have in mind. We're probably thinking about something that we're lathering onto our bodies, sometimes scrubbing in lotions, moisturizers, shampoos, basically mountains and mountains of products come to mind. But what's the evidence behind using these products? And how is all of this stuff ultimately affecting our skin's natural barriers and the defenders of our skin, including what we're learning more and more about, our skin's microbiome. Can doing much less save us time, money, energy, water, plastic bottles in the process, all while actually allowing us to live in healthier skin? Dr. James Hamblin is board certified in public health and general preventive medicine. He's a researcher, published author, and a staff writer at The Atlantic. He's the author of If Our Bodies Could Talk and Clean, a book about the skincare industry and skin microbiome. Dr. Hamblin joins us today to talk about hygiene. What do we mean by it? The culture around how we take care of our skin and the health benefits of doing much less. I was kind of like a lot of people had this vague notion that kind of everything that you would do from a, a daily shower to washing your hair to using deodorant or whatever, it, it was it was healthy. And I didn't, but I never really thought about why. I never thought about it even being a possibility to kind of do radically less. So once I started learning about the gut microbiome, which I'm sure you've talked about on this show, um, and thinking about um, diversity there and how, how you know, people came to really quickly understand that, you, you know, we don't want to just kill all the microbes in our gut. That would be bad. Um, and so why wouldn't something similar be true of our skin? Which is not to say that all microbes are good or bad, but just that maybe the goal should be diversity um, of microbial populations. So I started to wonder about that. And then as soon as I started thinking about that, kind of like, how have we not been, like, why are we just trying to kill everything all the time? I felt uh, kind of alone in that until I started writing about it. And a lot of people, it turns out, have had similar thoughts and experiences. We just don't talk about it. All right. So what's your favorite uh, skin microbe? <laughs> uh, I don't, I don't, I couldn't tell you one. Um, I have one, my favorite one to say. Okay, now you have to tell me if I'm saying it wrong. This is how I learned it in med school. Propriana bacterium. Is that the correct pronunciation? I've heard it said so many different ways because it, it is not like a <laughs> word that is meant to be pronounced by the human tongue. <laughs> yeah, you, th um, that's Propriana bacterium acnes. Yeah, usually. Yes. yes. Um, yeah, and that's one of the ones that they initially thought was associated with like, if you have this, then you have acne. And it was 
kind of reflective of this time, a very simplistic idea of like the presence of one microbe must be causing our skin condition <laughs> as opposed to mm-hmm. this elaborate orchestral uh, balance. Um, because it turns out that a lot of people have that bacterium and don't have issues with acne and, and vice versa. So they're just kind of these loose correlations. Why is that one your favorite? I just like saying it. I just, it <laughs> struck me. <laughs> yeah, It yeah. struck me when I was in med school. Um, uh, you know, I, I think a lot of us had outgrown acne at that point, but some of us hadn't. So we would just go around uh, saying it to each other. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it's kind of tough when you name a bacterium after a condition and then uh you know it's kind of like that correlation it can't really get out of people's minds. So in terms of it, how you grew up I'm just kind of reflecting I read some of your work and I thought it was super interesting but you know culturally like where I w- the way I grew up now I grew up in the US but the way I did was with parents who grew up thinking you should be oiling, not de-oiling, like Hmm. oil good, de-oiling bad. So, you know, that goes back to a lot of roots in Ayurveda and things like that, where so there was like a different oil for your hair and a different one that you thought about putting on your eyelashes or your eyebrows, and then definitely oiling your skin. I mean, like, oh, why wouldn't you? You'd be bananas (laughs) not to. And yeah. so, um, when, so when I had my first kid, it was like, okay, we've got the oil ready. Let's do this. And I, I didn't let them. So I, I just find it so interesting how we, you know, uh, we, we, our culture shifts so much and we, we move to different ways of thinking. But right. do you know anything about like the pro oil movement? Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, there's been certainly a globalization of of trends and a lot of crossover where people are doing uh, K beauty trends and people in in the U S are doing you know um, there people are trying all kinds of new things. Oil cleaning has become quite popular. I think um, there's always this sort of tension between like removing the oils and then moisturizing or adding things back. So I think most um, you know, people and cultures have some sort of moisturizer or conditioner, something that's, you know, synthetic or otherwise replacing the oils. Um, but, but it's always this dance that we're doing with different kinds of products, the soaps and detergents that remove oils and uh, then trying to hydrate back. The shampoo and conditioners. And that balance is one that it creates kind of a vicious cycle often, for, you know, for some people where they're washing pretty aggressively and then have to moisturize or add a lot of oil and um, can escalate. It's like an arms race. Yeah, it's so true. I mean, it's hilarious because we have, if I show up in front of my mom still to this day with my hair like unoiled and just like flapping in the breeze, she is just like disgusted by what I, why am I showing up at her door? Like not groomed appropriately. That's so interesting. Yeah. So what's in your regimen these days? What are you using or not using? Oh, um, well, I am a minimalist. I mostly clean with just water. I don't use um, shampoo or conditioner. I occasionally use a deodorant called uh, Soapwalla or by a company called Soapwalla. Um, And I use some... Uh, when, whatever kind of soap is handy, they're all the same to me. But I, I have a bottle of Dr. Bronner's that I'll use if I am particularly, like, visibly dirty. Or, uh, <laughs> you know, if you if you actually uh, use it very minimally and strategically. As opposed to kind of, you know, just uh, dousing my entire body every single day like I used to think was necessary and good. <laughs> but turned out to be, um, you know, kind of just a waste and actually really drying out my skin. Yeah, that's interesting. I um, I would say I'm, v- I'm probably more similar to what you're describing personally myself um, than my husband is. So we're like in a struggle for dominance over our children. <laughs> um, well, if one of you feels strongly, then I would say that uh, just go with that because a lot of this comes down to like belief and what you think is right or 
uh, necessary and uh, the kids will probably be okay either way. Really? You know, my husband, I believe, is an overwasher, quite mm-hmm. frankly. And I think the kids, you know, our oldest has really bad eczema. And oh, I... well, Yeah. I'm sort of like, isn't that the anti- like, should we not be trying to dry her out on a daily basis? Like, let's let these natural skin oils develop and stick around for a bit. Yep. I think that is the emerging consensus and what is the uh, best course of action. So uh, not to uh, intervene in any sort of family oh, no. dispute here, but please uh, do. <laughs> but no, I, I, well, there is this very American, uh, very you know, capitalist impulse to buy more things and apply more things and wash harder and scrub harder and do more um, to get rid of whatever is happening on your skin. And that's a natural impulse that is taught to us and sold to us. And so you have to, you know, like <laughs> the uh, to do less is not the way that American, well, medicine generally um, addresses things. And it probably, and it takes time for these things to work too. And so people, it's very normal to want to do more and add more products and wash harder. But I think the impulse is worth um, at, at least trying to do less. Right. I think you're right. We do have a very much of a pill for every ill and a cream for every itch kind of thought process. So yeah. So we have to, so we are certainly in our house trying to tamp down on that. But you talk a lot about not just, you know, like let, we'll get into the health benefits of doing less, but just in terms of some of the other things you found or time and just the environmental impact of buying all these products. Can you talk a little about that? Yeah. When you start to uh, break it down, um, if if people are spending 20 to 30 minutes uh, on uh, showering and self care and using many different products in a way that even just you know a generation or two ago uh, you know there used to be just one bar of soap and uh, one kind of shampoo maybe in the house and now everybody has all these different things which are being shipped in plastic bottles and uh, some of which are produced from fossil fuels or have large uh, energy imprints and uh, not to mention the water being used and the money that adds up. Uh, and all of that is the sort of thing that probably doesn't factor heavily for most people in terms of their budget and time. But when you look at it over the course of a year or a lifetime, especially if it's something that you're really not, it's really not serving you and <laughs> you don't enjoy it, then um, yeah, there's a lot of time and money and, uh, environmental footprint uh, gain to be had there by just doing less on a daily basis. So even if it's only a couple minutes that you're saving or changing, um, you know, uh, why not? Oh my God, this message would be just like, so my middle daughter would be so happy to hear this because she's always the one who's like, did you shower? Did you wash? And she's like, uh-huh. And you're like, well, nothing's wet anywhere so. <laughs> i'm not sure about that yeah uh, <laughs> but so what are and now what are some of the health benefits so you've said you've noticed personally just your skin feels less dry what are some of the other things that might be beneficial to us if we just pull back on on some of this degriming or oh well that that's the main thing um, health wise, I think you have to do, people are very different. Um, different people have different, you know, skin microbiomes, different genetics, different immune systems, different lifestyles. And, um, and people enjoy (laughs) certain habits and they're culturally appropriate. And so I'm, I don't, I, I'm not telling people that they, they should do less, but, but I can say that for many people who are dealing chronically with acne, eczema, psoriasis, um, just kind of general rashes that they don't know <laughs> what they are and um, are called eczema. Um, they, uh, there's uh, many people can, by cutting back on products, um, see improvements. And uh, so, you know, that's what I that's what I can say. I don't think that it's um, if you love washing a ton and you're very happy with your skin and uh, you have no issues and you have the time and money, then 
I, you know, more power to you. Have at it. Gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so in terms of the skin microbiome, I'd love to talk more about that. So we know a lot. I think when people think microbiome, our mind goes to the gut. And I think mm -hmm. more and more people know about the gut microbiome. What is it that you wish people would know more about the skin microbiome? Well, I wish everyone knew more about it because it is still a kind of burgeoning area of research. And you were just starting to see, just before uh, the COVID pandemic, um, the emergence of probiotic skin products. And in my mind, that was, and, and at some point will, <laughs> really change people's, you know, relationship to and thinking about the skin microbiome. And those obviously were forestalled by the era of like <laughs> uh, sold out, um, you know, hand sanitizer and kind of just like get, kill everything. Everything is bad. So that whole concept, uh, you know, was thrown by the wayside given like the emergency conditions. But overall, um, I think there's good reason to believe that similar to the gut where you can have you know, an overgrowth of something dangerous like Clostridium difficile because you did not have, um, you know, because you've been taking antibiotics and you were had uh, harmed or, um, you know, weakened your existing microbiome. It's almost certain that there are similar effects on the skin. So that while we, you mentioned Propionibacterium, bacterium, might be looking at like one thing, uh, what we really should be looking at is the the baseline. And so, you know, there are plenty of people walking around with, with C. diff in their gut and they're totally fine with it. It's not causing a problem and it only becomes a problem when everything else is disrupted. And that is this big blind spot where, um, you know, I think cultivating a healthy, uh, diverse skin microbiome shows holds enormous promise for a lot of these conditions that are not life-threatening, <laughs> but right. are a huge deal um, yeah. to a ton of people. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that I, I worry about like what we, what I was just doing, which is like kind of like the naming and shaming. So, you know, one, you identify some and then some are good, some are bad, and then you're trying yeah. to grow. But it's really about how they all are working together. And like you said, the diversity of the makeup and how they're interacting and that probably interacts with what you're eating, how well you're sleeping, what you're wearing, what else you're putting exactly. on your skin. Exactly. Yeah. And what oils you're putting on. That, you, that's sort of, you know, like the soil that you're um, yeah, uh, offering to these microbes. And so there are all kinds of ways that, that um, your microbiome can change. And we all know when we're you know, stressed out and not sleeping and not eating well, um, you, your skin probably doesn't look good and you might smell worse and you're blotchy or breaking out or all these things, these manifestations we're very familiar with. And yet the impulse is always, well, let's, you know, I need something topical to apply to that <laughs> as opposed to thinking more holistically about, um, cultivating and maintaining healthy skin. Right. That the unhealthy skin or whatever it is that you're noticing is probably an indication of maybe something deeper or something else that you might want to work on upstream rather than trying to just kind of put something on this this rash and, and hope it goes away. And if that doesn't, then add something else. Right, right. Well, it certainly can be. Yeah. And which is not to say there aren't products that occasionally will, will help, but that that is, you know, just one piece of the puzzle. Right, right. Absolutely. So what are you the most excited? So you're excited about some of these potential ways of, of using our knowledge of the microbiome to change how we think about treatments, commercial products. What are you? I, it's, it's hard for me to get excited about commercial products because I think what we've seen so far and what will likely happen is the boom of products that were similar to the gut microbiome products where um, the concept is sound and everyone would like to have a healthier gut by taking a certain pill or, um, you know, eating one specific food, um, but it won't likely be so simple or so universal. So 
yeah what am i excited about i don't just the <laughs> just the idea i think the um I think this is one of the final areas where people are, a lot of people are, you know, doing very different things that they believe to be necessary for self-care and hygiene um, that may or may not be good for them are taking up a lot of time and a lot of worry and a lot of sometimes money and energy and just, you know, uh, I'm most excited about people uh, embracing uh the diversity of approaches that can work and feeling empowered to do different things, to do less, to do more, to try all different kinds of things and um, find a routine that works for them and for others to not be judgmental and call them gross or disgusting or <laughs> something, which I have certainly experienced. And it's one of the final, I think, taboos where people, very, you know, thoughtful, conscientious people will still say that in a way that it's one of the few things that they would say that like to my face uh, about, wow like, you're gross that's disgusting um huh. you know wow that is so and that's what i was going to ask you in terms of the feedback you've gotten both live in person and out there in the ether of the internet to to some of what you're saying with regard to you know changing or at least looking at our hygiene habits so people have said that to you straight up to your face you're gross. Um, well, to my, I guess to my virtual face. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. Yeah. No. I. I've. I'm. I try to be really careful about um, being presentable and professional, and making sure that I don't smell offensive, um, and that I look, you know, put together enough to um, not be distracting <laughs> to anyone. Um, I. But uh, it, so it's more in responses to to my written work and um me media appearances and, and people just have this visceral gut reaction that's very judgmental and they use words like disgusting or gross um that actually don't mean anything <laughs> from a hygiene perspective they're not I, I i would i'm very conscientious about not transmitting uh you know infectious disease i wash my hands um I, i'm very good about you know masking and not going out when i have a cold and all these things that we all need to do way better at. But what we don't need to do way better at is, you know, washing our hair. And if you don't, you know, you're not, um, no one needs to call you gross. So yeah, that's a long roundabout answer to saying, I'm just excited about breaking that down. And I think a lot of people, once you start talking about these things, you realize there's a lot of people who do very little or very different things. And they just don't talk about it because they feel self-conscious about it. They feel like they're an outlier. People will judge them. All right. No, I think just in our conversation, it's just interesting because growing up for me, it was definitely very different in terms of how frequently, you know, you washed your hair. Did you use products? Uh, you know, I definitely, I don't think we had like soap or bar soap in our house for a long time growing up. It was really just like, you know, water. And, mm -hmm. uh, and that was it. And then you came out when your hair was dry, if it started, like, fl flying, if you had flyaways, then you were oiled again. So yeah, uh, yeah that's a perfect illustration of how di different approaches can be, um, you know, not just effective, but people can feel that they are the only like they are the necessary and right way. And other people will totally just, you know, are doing essentially the total opposite thing of trying to wash all the oil away and thinking that is necessary and good. So it's one thing if this is just a habit, like, oh, I just like it. I just like when my hair looks this way, you know, and it's just personal preference. That's fine. But but because of the marketing and because these products are sold in the pharmacy right next to all the medicines, and it, it feels like if I don't use these things, I'm not a good, I'm not taking care of myself and my family. And that is the really you know, kind of malicious misconception. Right. That's what I worry about too with prebiotic and probiotic washing on mm -hmm. on labels. So I'm interested to see what happens with that and skin products. Oh yeah. No, I have no misconceptions about the industry <laughs> embracing this in any way other than trying to add another daily use product to our routines because that is kind of the holy grail of Self-care is like 
you can get something into someone's routine where they feel like they have to use it every single day. And uh, so that's surely what, that's surely the goal, but it'll be similar to the shampoo conditioner cycle. Just like, so you're supposed to use this antibacterial soap and then apply these probiotics that we <laughs> sell and we sell both of them. And <gasps> I hope people will <laughs> question that. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, that is just such a such a great point. I mean, I just think to the industry in terms of adolescent girls, I think there is a study that there's something like 15 to 16 products that um, are being are marketed as like daily use, like step by step, here's step one, and then you do mm. the toner, and then you do the moisturizer, and then you do this and that. And it's, it's hard to to not feel like you're doing it right. Oh, man. Yeah. Especially at that age where you are certainly feeling like you, you need to do things because everyone else is doing them or because, you, you know, you don't, you're just beginning to learn about uh, uh, taking care of yourself. And um, I think the aspirational goal is really just to narrow it down to things that truly <laughs> you enjoy and bring or bring value to you um, and, and to let, let go of the other stuff. Right. So what are you burning to tell us about that I just didn't ask you? But you're like, hello, why didn't you ask <laughs> me about this? <laughs> um, I think you've asked uh, great questions. I don't know. I've, I've talked about this book uh, at so much length that uh, I forget what is interesting about it. Some people are interested by the pandemic and its effects on our perceptions about these things. I did write the book before and it came out in July of 2020. So that was that was already a time when you were starting to, people were voluntarily being like, oh, you know what, I don't need to shower every day. And suddenly it was way less radical of a concept. Or people, you know, people are coming to meeting or Zoom meetings or whatever without, you know, not as done up as they would have been in the office. And those standards have, I think, radically shifted in the last couple of years in a, in a, in a positive way that ho hopefully, you know, is maintained and, and people realize like there's just more you can be professional you can be um you know socially acceptable without uh and it doesn't have to be defined as narrowly as it used to be right yeah that's a great point uh well what are you working on next are you going deeper into the body or more <laughs> i am going to never write about <laughs> hygiene or skin microbes <laughs> again no i'm figuring out what the next book is and, um Fair. we'll see taking suggestions but i need something else yeah. i am not the guy who <laughs> what's exciting to you right now post covid that you're um, if not a book that you're just kind of looking at the research into i don't know I, I keep following infectious disease because that's what people keep asking me about and what people keep uh, wanting me to write about with polio and uh, the pox virus that I, I, I would say I suggest I, I, I stand with the city of New York and the World Health Organization in thinking that we really need a new name. And I think the simplest would be M pox just because, you know, we can't call it something radically different, but it that it is a something where stigma is our main, um, you know, enemy. And if we can overcome that and just that the name is silly and archaic and useless. <laughs> so, right. No, call it I th but yeah. 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 No, yeah. that's a great point. I'm glad you pointed that out too. Cause I think it was great that we moved away from place-based naming during COVID um, and the various oh, variants yeah. that were, were coming out. Yeah. People say it's too late with this, with the pox virus, but I, I think <laughs> people don't realize how quickly things change. Like you remember those variants that were named after places and then all of a sudden now we're just calling them Alpha and Omicron and people are completely used to it. And, and maybe it seemed weird for like 48 hours, but yeah. it became totally no, I think normal. Yeah. yeah, I appreciate the correction there because I really, I think you are so right about that, that it, it just frames not only like once you destigmatize, it just everyone it's more approachable to to do the the right thing and the it's so yeah i i think we'll see that as like uh an archaic uh just as archaic as naming variants after 
specific places, <laughs> like calling the t- telling people that they are like a certain animal because they have this disease essentially is so uh, unprofessional and not not clinically appropriate, um, in my humble opinion. So I guess that would be the thing I'm excited to tell you <laughs> is that I that I think. But the thing they the play, people have called for this but have not put out a good suggestion sense like the world health organization was like let's call it mp6 vxow or something you know (laughs) you're like yeah people are gonna call it that like (laughs) (laughs) yeah i've seen a couple of iterations yeah but uh, you're right we just need to label it something and and let's move forward right or like something people will actually call you know people using daily conversation because that's that's what really matters and not not just i mean especially not clinicians like people who are or getting the word out out there community yeah yeah i um uh, very much appreciate your humble opinion so thank you for it (laughs) thank you (laughs) and i appreciate you for this conversation thank you so much thank you it's been fun so my main takeaway today is probably to buy a lot less for myself and my family I'm also going to think about ways to teach my daughters about what that means and how they can still feel like they have a healthy hygiene routine without feeling the need to buy so many different kinds of products with questionable claims. If you want to learn more about Dr. James Hamlin or his take on hygiene, skin microbiome, or other health-related topics, visit www.jameshamlin.com. Thanks for listening to Health Discover, a podcast by WebMD. I'm Dr. Neha Bhattak, Chief Physician Editor of Health and Lifestyle Medicine, and I want all skin to be radiant and healthy. Thank you so much, and I'll see you next time.